on this worship day, we turn our attention to the word of our God. This is Resurrection 3. Our first lesson, our historical lesson, is found recorded for us in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Do note, this text will serve as the basis for our sermon. <coughs> Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any men or women belonging to the way, he might bring them to Jerusalem as prisoners. As he went on his way and was approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? He replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you need to do. The men traveling with him stood there speechless. They heard the voice, but did not see anyone. They raised Saul up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see anything. They took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. For three days he could not see, and he did not eat or drink. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord told him, Go, get up, and go into the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. In fact, at this very moment he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so he can regain his sight. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many people about this man, and how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. The Lord said to him, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the peoples of Israel. Indeed, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Ananias left and entered the house. Laying his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus whom you saw on your way here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Here ends our first lesson. Let's then turn to our epistle lesson for this evening. Our epistle lesson is found recorded for us in the book of Revelation. Revelation 5, verses 11 through 14. Another section where, in this prophetic book, you see the glory and the majesty of our Savior, Jesus. And I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels who were around the throne and around the living creatures and the elders. Their number was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands upon thousands. With a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I also heard every creature that is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen, and the elders bowed down and worshiped. Here ends our epistle lesson. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Our hearts were burning within us while he was speaking to us along the road and while he was explaining the scriptures to us. Alleluia. Please rise for the gospel. The holy gospel for this evening is found recorded for us in John, John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Jesus and his disciples at the Sea of Galilee. After this, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They replied, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus was standing on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus called them, Boys, don't you have any fish? 
No, they answered. He told them, throw your net on the right side of the boat. You will find some. So they cast the net out. Then they were not able to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And Simon Peter heard, it is the Lord. He tied his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they stepped out on land, they saw some bread and a charcoal fire with fish on it. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter climbed aboard and hauled the net to land full of large fish, 153 of them. Yet even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, eat breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and also the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Here ends our gospel lesson. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we wish to contemplate for this evening is found recorded for us in Acts, Acts chapter 9. Let me highlight for you just 5b. He replied, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Thus far, God's word lets you and I, of course, continue with prayer. Gracious and merciful Father, what a complete and awesome joy it is to be your children and heirs of eternal life, to be able to be gathered here to give you praise and glory and honor simply because we are your children. We are, we are saved and we are heirs of eternal life. What an absolute joy this is. Continue to be our help, our guide, and our confidence in all things. In Jesus we pray, amen. I want you to think, think about that last sin that you were involved in. Need some help? Maybe you were lipping off to your parents when they asked you to do something. Maybe it was a tirade of bad language as you got upset about something and you vented vehemently. Was it that last time that you fabricated that great big lie because you think lying is going to get you somewhere? Perhaps it was while you were shopping, you saw that the cashier missed something, but you didn't say anything. Your teacher at school asked you to sit down and be quiet, and you just defied him or her to the utmost. Was it the pictures you were looking at? Got a little tipsy the other day? How about perhaps you were just sitting at home defying the desire of Jesus that you worship and praise him? Maybe, maybe it's just that stupid little sin that you refuse to give up, though you know it's eating at your soul. Is it that gambling problem? That drug problem, not being kind and compassionate problem. <clears throat> See, I want you to think about the sin you were last involved in. And then ask yourself what you would do if while you were in the midst of that sin, Jesus Christ himself was all of a sudden standing right next to you. And you look over and there he is, and it's no doubt it's him. He's standing right there, looking right at you, watching your sinfulness, shaking his head. And you notice he has tears in his eyes. Tears because your sin and defiance of him causes hurt and harm in his heart. Well, now what? You realize there are basically two possible reactions to Jesus in this situation. The first is to look at him, see his tears, and then grimly say, what is your problem? And then you just keep doing your wrong as if there's not a thing wrong because in your darkened mind, 
Jesus is the problem or his word is the problem, but not you. No, not you. The other possible reaction, the right one, is that you fall on your knees and you say, Lord, I am such a miserable sinner. Help me. Forgive me, please. And all I can say is that I pray that whether it's you or me in that scenario, that it is words of faith and repentance that come out of our mouths. Because you see, for the Christian, that is the only godly and faith-based answer. You realize why I ask such questions tonight, don't you? It's because in the life of a fellow by the name of Saul, such is exactly what happened to him. Well, it's a bit more involved for Saul because the Lord has plans for this persecutor and killer of Christians. Let's you and I look at this history of our text and contemplate this lesson under the theme, When Jesus Speaks. If you're like me, you recognize the history before us as one of the more dramatic and awe-inspiring events of the redemptive work of Jesus. Here it is a number of months after the ascension of Jesus into heaven, and here is this man by the name of Saul, and he has begun a campaign, a campaign against those who have declared their faith in Jesus. Oh, we started out small. See, Saul was the man who basically headed the stoning of Stephen, the very first Christian martyr of the church. But it seems from that point on, this man, filled with zealousness and fervor for the work of God, took it upon himself to persecute and jail, and when necessary, kill those who followed Jesus. And he was so thorough at his job that in just a number of months, he needed to go to other large towns since all the Christians in Jerusalem were in deep hiding or gone. So he gets, he gets from the Jewish leaders letters of authority to go to Damascus and weed out the Christians in that city. And Saul is doing all of this in the name of Adonai Elohim, the Lord God. See, the Lord and God of the Jews. The problem is that Saul is wrong. You see, instead of serving the Lord God, the true Lord God, Saul is actually following a path of evil. He's actually rejecting Jesus as Lord and Savior. Yes, actually rejecting everything that his Jewish religion had always been about. The Jewish religion was about the Savior to come. The Jewish religion was about the Savior who would forgive sins and redeem God's people from their sins. Saul had for the last number of months been rounding up and destroying the lives of those who dared to follow Jesus, the guy, the guy that Saul felt sure in his heart, sure in his heart, was a fake and a phony in each and every way. On his way to Damascus, Saul will learn he is wrong. And from this point on, his life, his very being is to be changed. Saul is confronted as he's going out to fulfill his murderous desires. He's confronted by the living, the risen Lord Jesus. And imagine his shock when a light from heaven flashes around him and he falls hard to the ground. And imagine his shock as he hears that voice and those cutting words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Please don't miss the depth of those words. If you really want to be accurate, we would have to say Saul is really persecuting believers in Jesus. I mean, he's just persecuting the people who follow Jesus. But it is clear that Jesus takes this persecution on a personal level. And so what becomes evident is that every believer struck was a blow struck against Jesus. 
Every hateful word spoken against the faith is a hateful word to Jesus. Every violation of God's law is a violation against Jesus. In truth, that is the nature, the nature of each and every sin. Sins are an affront to our God and Lord. They are directed against Him and His graciousness. Please, please, let the depths of these words sink in. And Saul says, Who are you, Lord? And again, I want you to marvel at these words. Saul doesn't know who is speaking to him, and yet a few things are already very, very clear to him. He clearly understands that he's being confronted by a supreme being. And he's being confronted in such a way that there's no doubt that this is the Lord. See, Saul uses the very name of God given to Moses at that burning bush. The I am. This is the Lord. This is before him the gracious, compassionate, all-knowing, all-powerful God of creation in whose hands rest the redemption and souls of mankind. And although Saul doesn't have a specific name at this point, it's clear that Saul grasped that the one confronting him is the Lord, the ruler of all. And he gets his answer. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I, I can only imagine Saul's shock and his drastic confusion at this point. Jesus? Oh, no. Je Jesus, as far as I'm concerned, is, is fake and phony. He's a false god. He's an idol that, that silly Jewish people have been conned into following and believing. Jesus? You are Jesus. And at this point, or rather shortly after this point, Saul realized that all along he has been opposing, he has been fighting against, he has been hating, and he has been spewing hatred at the one who really is his God and his Lord. And you and I know how this history continues. So for instance, the men with him saw the light and they heard the voice, but they didn't see anyone. And I think they too are in total shock and confusion. And they now lead the blind Saul into the city of Damascus. And for the next three days, we are told, the Lord just let Saul sit and wait. Oh. Again, learn a lesson from this. You see, for Saul, the best thing for him was to sit and wait. This gave him time to contemplate and to think. I want you to notice the text says he doesn't even eat. He's rattled to the core. But the best thing for him is to sit and wait. You know, the Lord, the Lord always knows what is best and always does what is best for us, even when he has us sitting and waiting for his gracious goodness and love. So don't get upset about sit and wait. Rather, learn to trust the Lord. Learn to trust that the Lord knows what he's doing. And if anything, ask yourself what you should be learning as you sit and wait on the Lord. Eventually, Saul has a vision, and a Christian by the name of Ananias is also sent the vision. And again, pay attention. Saul was very well known as a hater of Jesus. Ananias is given a vision by the Lord to go and find Saul, and Ananias doesn't want to go. The Lord tells him, go anyway. And so it is. And actually, what a good example of faith is found in Ananias here. Because God says, go, and even though he is afraid, and even though he doubts God's wisdom here, notice he goes. Because to believe means to hear and to follow. What we'll then hear is that Saul has his blindness healed. Oh, very dramatic. It's like scales from his eyes, we're told. And listen again to what Ananias says. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, whom you saw on your way here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And you know what I think? I think Saul has very much, very much, during the ministry of Jesus, he's been a stooge and an arm of the Jewish leaders. I think Saul, while Jesus was alive, actually heard and saw his miracles. I think Saul was definitely in the crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him. I think Saul saw Jesus die. And now he has seen the living and risen Jesus. That's why there's no second guessing here. There's no trying to pass this off, pass off this miraculous conversion of some sort of delusion or something like that. Saul knew that the person he saw was Jesus, the very Jesus he had worked against on behalf of the Jewish leadership. Jesus has appeared to him. And now Saul is given the gift of the Holy Spirit through baptism. Understand the job of the Holy Spirit is to call, gather, and strengthen people in the wonder and marvel of Jesus. Trust me, Saul is going to experience a lot more in the months and the years to come. That's because this Saul is later on going to be called the Apostle Paul, the very apostle this church is named after. You know, Paul, the man who absolutely now believes in Jesus as his Lord and Savior from sin. Paul will become a premier disciple of Jesus. Paul will become instrumental in the spread and in the wonder of what Jesus is about. And all of this is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. You are here because of the Holy Spirit of God. You are listening or reading or thinking about Jesus because of the Holy Spirit of God. On Sunday morning, we are bringing a soul into the kingdom of God by baptism. Dear people, that's the same baptism given to Saul. The same baptism that made him Paul. The baptism that God says brings salvation and forgiveness because of the power and the wonder of Jesus and his redemption. It's the same baptism that God still uses to grant souls faith and redemption in Jesus. This man, who would be called Paul, is later on responsible for 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. His writing, directed by the Holy Spirit, will lay out and reveal the depth and the marvel of what Jesus is about. Not because that's what he wants to do, but rather because that's what Jesus now calls him to do. And think about this. He goes from being an enemy of God to a servant of God. He goes from being a hater of the light to follower and reflector of the light. Dear people, such is the power and marvel of Jesus, Jesus who lives and reigns over all for the good of his church and the salvation of souls. And, and what an impact. What an impact this call of Jesus will have. In the New Testament, we are told of at least three missionary journeys that Paul goes on just to share this message of Jesus. This man will endure so much for Jesus. Listen to Paul give a catalog of events. This is found for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Are they ministers of Christ? I'm speaking in a crazy way. I am even more. I've done more hard work, been in prisons more often, been whipped far more. I've been close to death many times. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. One time I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day on the open sea. I have often been on journeys in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, in danger on the sea, in danger among false brothers. I have worked hard and struggled. I have spent many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty. I've gone without food many times. I've been cold and lacked clothing. And I want you to know that's 
not all that Paul says about his ministry. He goes on to speak about his visions and the revelations that he has from the Lord God. And then he speaks about that thorn in his flesh, that thorn that he asked God to take away three times, we're told. But the Lord God told him it was for his own good and his own salvation that that thorn would remain. And he concludes this catalog of his life in this way. That is why I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for the sake of Christ. Yeah. Why all of this? For the sake of Christ. That we might proclaim Christ and live Christ. That we might glorify and honor him. That we might share his love and compassion. His sure and certain grace and mercy given to each of us. That we might be confident in his salvation and the truth of faith. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit into our lives to give. God is still working among us. God is still proclaiming Jesus. Jesus, the Savior and the Son of God. Jesus, our hope and confidence, our hope in our life now and in the life to come. And I pray that when Jesus comes to you, that you will hear and believe. And he does come to us. He comes in his word. He speaks to us in his written word. He proclaims his marvel and majesty in his word. He tells us of his suffering and death for our souls in his word. He proclaims his resurrection and eternal life in his word. You see, every time you and I hear the Bible, that's Jesus speaking to us. Jesus telling us his truth and wonder. And every time we hear the Bible, God tells us the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts and minds for the granting of faith and salvation. It is Jesus upon whom our faith rests. Jesus who saves, Jesus who changes hearts and lives by his holy and inspired word. The very word he speaks to us. May all of us humbly and truly hear and believe in Jesus. Amen. Gracious and merciful Father, we do indeed come to you and give you thanks and praise and glory and honor for the wonder and marvel of your Son, Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, in many ways we are just like Saul. We fight against you, we rebel against you, we, we don't think you're all that important. We thank you, dear Lord, for sending your Holy Spirit into our lives. We we'll all gather, enlighten, and strengthen us in the one true faith. Thank you for making us your children and heirs of eternal life. We thank you for leading us to understand that Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross for our sins and then rose again from the dead that we might have this awesome and sure gift of eternal life and salvation because of what Jesus has done. But Lord, one of the gifts of faith is that issue of repentance. When we recognize our sins, we as your children repent. Not to get forgiveness. Because all of a sudden we were reminded again that Jesus Christ has forgiven our sins. Jesus Christ is gracious and merciful and we're filled with sorrow and we ask for your help and divine wisdom in our lives that you would help us to overcome these sins and help us to, to bring you glory and honor and praise and everything we do. And that's the struggle that we have. The struggle of giving you praise and honor and glory and the struggle against sin. Tell us in your holy word that there's a battle going on, and it's a battle between our sinful flesh and the spirit that's within us. And boy, we know that battle. The truth of the matter is, dear Lord, that battle is proof that we are your children and heirs of eternal life. Because without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't care about the battle. We wouldn't care if we're doing right or wrong or, or what we're doing. So, dear Lord, that battle of what we're doing the right thing, the wrong thing, that's a sign that you are with us. and. You, are, you have granted us that, that gift of salvation in Jesus. Our job, dear Lord, then, is to help share that message of Jesus with all the world. Help us to do that, dear Lord. Help us to speak Jesus. Help us to, help, help us to 
proclaim Jesus, to, to let everyone see Jesus, to reflect Jesus in all that we do. That is our life. We ask this in the name of Jesus, He who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.